Good morning, church. The reading is as follows. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in the search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Hear the word of the Lord. Morning, church. It's a great privilege to be with you here this morning, um, especially as we kick off this very important series, Deeper. Um, it is such an important topic to just talk about going deeper, um, deeping in our relationship with our Lord and Savior, um, deeper in our outreach, our ministry, our outflow of this relationship we have with the Lord. Um, we all find ourselves, and this is actually a global phenomena in church worldwide, um, especially in here in Gauteng as well. Um, things have been quite tough coming out of COVID. Um, I'm sure that's not a surprise, all right? <laughs> um, we had a lot of unseen things like never before. You know, we're kind of finding ourselves currently in a type of um, recession. Globally, things are slowing down. Um, we're having East and West uh, in a massive war in, in Ukraine, which is affecting all our food prices. Um, it is just crazy what's going on now. Um, so that all to say that our world is kind of keeping us concerned about so many different things. We talked about decisions just now in our question of the day, and I quickly googled how many decisions do we make a day, and more or less people say we make more or less 35,000 decisions per day. All right, just think about that. As a man, it's probably a little bit less, you know, but um, <laughs> as a woman, it's uh, much more. I don't know how they work that out, how they work the gender in there, but any case. Um, but that all to say is that we find ourselves in a global reality that our spiritual lives are actually um, laying on the floor coming out of this world. Stress is more. Decisions are more. It's more complex. It's more dramatic. It's more impactful. People died. Um, it's just affecting our spiritual lives. And we know it's not that the world is coming to an end and the Lord has forgotten us and now our spiritual lives are dry. But it's just one of the results of a world that has changed so drastically that suddenly everything gets questioned in your life. Um, all your convictions, all your decisions, everything just becomes much more serious than it did before COVID started. Um, and that's why it's so special to do a deeper series, isn't it? Um, that we can... Cry out to God and say, God, help us. God, help us with our 35,000 decisions every day um, that we can make good decisions. Because here's the reality. If you make bad decisions, they have bad results, isn't that? That's the one fear we have in our hearts. Um, and that's why it's so important to be here this morning, because if we, um, as Christians, take our Bible seriously, take the gospel seriously, we know we are at the right place. Um, but I'll delve deeper into that as we... Um, venture deeper. But here's the one thought that I want to leave with you as our Lord prayed his high priestly prayer in um, John 17. He prayed that to his father, he said, Lord, um, this is eternal life. Eternal life is to know you and me, your son, whom you've sent to come to this earth. So you making one of the best decisions in your life this morning to not just be here, but to see God. That is one of the most important decisions you can make in your life. And I want us to cry out to God to help us as we flesh and work this out. Even if you're still working out your relationship with the Lord, you're not sure if you're a Christian or if you're the oldest Christian here this morning, that's the most important thing you can be busy with is your relationship with the Lord. Because that word eternal life says that's the ultimate life. That's the good life. It can only be found with God. And I want us to cry out to God to help us this morning. All right, let us close our eyes. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we know and believe it is true. Lord, thank you that it has stood the test of time. Lord, thank you that your Spirit has revealed that to us. Lord, we pray that you help us this morning. Lord, we struggle um, this side of eternity. Lord, specifically as our world feels like it's falling apart, the idols, the, the things that promise the good life um, is not satisfying, Lord. Our relationships, our work, our social lives. Lord, it's, it's so broken at the moment. We're so aware of that. And Lord, it has created in us a dryness, um, a shallowness in our, our relationship with you. Just our spiritual reality is so, so broken, Lord. Um, please help us this morning, Lord, to, to shed light on our lives. 
um, to give us a clearer picture of, of how it is like in your kingdom, Lord, the kingdom of heaven, um, the rule and reign where you are supreme, Lord, where, where it's really the good life, the eternal life. Um, please give us light and help us this morning, Lord. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. All right, so I'm catching the grift now. When you preach here at Fellowship City, you have to start with a picture. All right, if you don't start with a picture, it's not legitimate. All right, um, so I went to find my own picture and I found this lovely picture. Rudolf, you guys can help me there. Um, it is pixelating a bit, it's not nearly as impressive as any other summary of a book of the Bible. Um, who knows what picture this is? Uh, or who's drawn it? Um, it is uh, a picture drawn by uh, Rembrandt in the 17th century. Okay, so my picture is much older than all the others, so respect it. Okay? Um, but what I love about this um, drawing is that um, it actually sums up our entire passage this morning. All right, and I'm going to go in, in deeper depth into it. Um, but when Rembrandt painted this, he could have painted anything else. Um, in those days, it was somewhat popular that good um, painters would draw relative things in their world. And being the Christian world that was quite massive in that time, a lot of the pictures were about Christian stories or parables or things like that. But Rembrandt only drew a few of these type of biblical narratives. And this is one of the parables he decided to draw. So obviously something um, captured his mind and his imagination that he decided he's going to devote his time and effort to draw this painting. Now I want you guys to just observe a few things here. Um, you can see there, this is maybe not light, uh, you know, clear enough, um, but here on the right hand corner you can see the treasure as this guy was um, digging. He found something probably blinking there in the field and he finds this treasure. Um, his shovel is in his right hand. And then he looks over his shoulder, he looks backwards towards the city there. Um, so in those days, cities didn't look as big as um, Pretoria or Gauteng. Um, they kind of looked more like the Platteland now, you know, small little town with something central, and it looks like their structure. Um, but he's looking back to the city as he's seeing this treasure that he found in the field. And you see this tension here that he's contemplating. He's contemplating what does he need to go and sell back home to buy this field where the treasure is. Can you kind of pick that up? And, and I love what Rembrandt did here because he, he sketched this, this tension so beautifully in this painting um, that this guy just discovered this treasure, but he's looking back to what he needs to go and sell to buy the field to get this treasure and find the rest of the treasure that's um, hidden in front of him. So that picture, keep in your mind as we um, discuss our passage this morning. Um, this guy obviously loved many things but he knew in order to get this ultimate treasure, you'll need to let go what is back in the city to buy this ultimate treasure. All right, so in our passage this morning, uh, the shortest one I ever had to preach from, um, we want to quickly pack it out a bit and then we want to get real with it. Um, but I do want to um, put a caution out there. It is quite intense. Um, it is a really serious passage and I think it is really important for us, therefore, to appreciate the depth and the seriousness um, of this passage. So Jesus loved to teach with parables. It was a communication style, teaching style in those times. Um, like we would go to university and sit in a lecture. It was way more creative, it was way more oratory in nature. So parables was a very important way of communicating a deeper spiritual truth. Um, at the beginning of this long teaching, um, Jesus described to his um, disciples why he uses these parables. So in te uh, th uh, Matthew 13, verse 10 to 16, um, I've put it up there. You guys can follow there if you want to. Um, but Jesus said the reason he used these parables was to communicate the truths, uh, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, um, same thing. Uh, Matthew, being the writer of this gospel, um, written primarily to a Jewish context, um, wouldn't have wanted to use the word kingdom of God because Yahweh, that God, was blasphemous to just use like that. Um, that's why he says the kingdom of heaven. So don't get distracted there. Um, so what Matthew is saying, um, and Jesus then saying to the disciples, is that the kingdom of God is being communicated through these parables, the way it works in the kingdom of God. All right. So it's for us very important then to sit up and to listen what God is saying here because it's profound in what he's saying to his disciples. He just had a long teaching um, next to the Sea of Galilee. 
Then his disciples goes to the one side, and then he tells them more of these parables. So we are actually sitting in a very privileged position to hear what God is saying to his disciples. This is like the inner workings of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, how it is to be a Christian and how you go deeper. So our attention should come up. Um, our attention should be here because in verse 16, um, Jesus says, Blessed are you to see what you see, if you listen to what God has to say. Um, all right, so let's get into what is going on here. Um, so if we look at this first parable in verse 44, um, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Um, the treasure in a field was common in those days. There was no APSA, FMB, Capitec, E-Bucks, nothing like that. Um, the world was very unstable. There was very little stability. You hardly have one empire ruling and reigning, and then another one takes over, and then everything goes. There's no stability in the civilization um, for a long extended period of time. This time, when it was written, it's more or less the Roman period, when they are ruling and reigning the world. Um, and you often had to go to war, or you had to leave for some other family matter to somewhere else in the world, um, and you had to hide your precious belongings somewhere, because you can't just leave it somewhere. Surely there were some places where you could leave something, but you don't know if this person is going to be there if you come back, or if you would have sold that. Um, so one of the ways of hiding your treasure was to go and bury it somewhere. Right? It was a common practice. You'd find a remote place somewhere out in the field where no one would probably go and you would hide your treasure there and you would go on your journey um, and you would come back later if you need that treasure again. Um, it's probably how people started to um, hide from the tax man and so on and so forth. All right. So you would hide your treasure somewhere in the field. All right. So that was common practice. Um, but you can imagine then that it was quite often experience of someone to just stumble across a treasure of someone else. Let's say someone buried a treasure at a remote place. Um, and let's say you were a farmer, you were working the field many years later, that person probably passed away, whose treasure was hidden there, maybe passed away in war, or his family died of a um, sickness or death. And then you just discover this treasure and find his keepers. If you found this treasure, um, that can be yours. But obviously you just shouldn't go around, there wasn't those machines, you saw those guys ever walking, they're looking for the things under the ground. So it was quite nice if you could find this treasure, if you can imagine Rain, just how that deteriorates ground in the urban areas, uh, in the uh, greater uh, areas out of the city. It might wash it open. There's so many ways that these treasures could have been found. All right, so you guys kind of catch the grift of what's going on here. Um, so picture this world then, which is more like Zimbabwe rather than uh, Switzerland. All right, it's instability. Treasures are buried in the open field, and you find this treasure and it's yours. But now you sit with a dilemma. There's this big treasure. Um, you need to buy this field to obtain this treasure. You can't just go digging around everywhere. You need to go and buy that. Um, so Jesus then concludes that this treasure finder goes in all his joy, because he found this amazing treasure, um, and all that he owns in that city so that he can purchase this piece of land so that he can get this treasure. Yeah. All right, very simple, very profound parable that Jesus tells. In order to obtain this amazing treasure... He needed to go and sell everything that he has so that he can purchase this field so that he can get that treasure. And his joy is driving him to do that. All right. Because he knows there's so much more coming. Yes, it's painful to let go of that, but there's so much more that is in here. All right. But our second parable is almost the same, but there is a very important um, difference here. So in the time of Matthew, the... Um, the Roman Empire were obsessed with pearls. It was like the common uh, commodity of that time. All right? um, they would pay fortunes if you could find them pearls. So that ended up creating merchants. People would go around all around the coastal regions where you would find these pearls in under the sea, um, and they would try and look for these pearls where someone maybe have dived and found that. Then they would go and sell, once again, everything they have so that they can purchase this pearl um, and then try and sell that to the Roman Empire or someone very important there um, so that they can have the good life now. They don't have to work again because they've sold the pearl for a great fortune. So the difference here in this parable compared to the previous one is that this merchant was actively seeking. This merchant was really laboring hard to find these pearls. 
He was constantly searching. He wasn't just stumbling across it like the um, first parable where the treasure finder finds it, but he actively was known as a merchant in search of these fine pearls that would make him supremely rich. All right, so the point is very clear for us in our two parables here. Um, You cannot find anything more precious than this kingdom of heaven. Jesus is equating that for us in these two parables. And you won't waste any second of your life by giving your all to try and find the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Right, that's crystal clear from um, our two parables. Or maybe to put it in another way, um, you'll be a fool if you don't give your best effort to find the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples as they are sitting here with him. This is the most important thing that you can be busy with. Any other pursuit or labor in your life would be worthless if you're not primarily seeking the kingdom of God. It is drastic what God is saying here. But there's a very odd truth as well hidden in this parable that I think we as as modern, relatively comfortable people living in Pretoria don't understand. And here's why I say comfortable. I know our social class here is relatively different, but none of us fought in a war. Um, None of us recently died of a a massive plague. Yes, we had COVID, but it was not nearly as bad as it was in that life. Um, In the 70s, we discovered anesthetics, so none of us who had an operation had to go in without anything softening that for us. Um, You can make a living today in Gauteng, South Africa, without having a work, having a job. It's possible for you to just live on the street without having a job by living off gifts and donations and things like that. That was not possible in this world. The world in which God has written this, it was, it was crazy. It was people dying regularly because of starvation. You would walk around in the street and you find people dead because they didn't have food. So I'm saying this respectfully because knowing we come from different areas, um, but I want us to just appreciate the controversialness of this passage in the time that it was written. It was much more unjust ever than we would have lived in the last 30 years of our civilization. Um, all right, so um, we, we get then now deeper into this, this reality, and this truth that I think we easily overlook then is the fact that both these people, the treasure finder as well as the merchant, had to go and sell everything. And I want us to just unpack that a bit, because that can be very controversial. You have on one side of the spectrum people who say, you know what, Um, to be a real Christian, you must be owning zero possessions. Um, You should be living in uh, in a church somewhere, and you should be serving people as a priest. That is, that is the way you should interpret this. Um, or other people say, yeah, it doesn't really mean that. Um, just kind of play, play religion, you know. It, it means something else. And I want us to just try and pack it out. definitely doesn't mean you should go and live in the Malayas and live in a monastery or do something like that. Um, it's definitely conveying something deeper and more complex in this very complex world that we are living in. So I want us just to, to venture through that as we, um, as we come to this passage. Um, All right, so think of what Jesus said to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. So just a few chapters later, um, Jesus says to him, and he was very moral, this guy was keeping the law perfectly, he tithed everything, he did everything right. And Jesus says to him, go and sell everything that you own, and then you come and follow me. So here we get some glimpse of what Jesus is saying here. If you want to follow him, you have to be able to let everything go, in order to follow him. All right, I'm going to go to a few of these passages to try and help us um, figure out what's going on. In Luke 14, Jesus says, if you um, want to follow him, you must literally hate everything else that is in your world if you want to come and follow him. So once again, quite a hard truth to say. Jesus, you saying, I should love my wife, I should love my children, but now you're saying I should hate them if I truly want to follow you. So once again, it's complicated what's going on here. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, take up your cross, come and die if you want to follow me. So here's a lot of complex statements that we need to balance out here. Why is God so jealous? How is this working? Is he not having any appreciation of the complexity of my life? Um, I know some of my black friends say black tax, which is a 
very important thing. I need to take care of all my family. I'm the only one who came to study. I need to solve all my family's problems. You don't have, Jesus, a clue how complex my life is. So hang in here with me. Hang in here with me. We're going to get there. Um, so there's some nuances that I want us to just contemplate. So think back again to our picture here. As we contemplate and look back to the city, um, I want us to look at the Apostle Paul. And this is the clearest explanation of what is going on here for me as I look at the Bible. So Philippians 3, verse 3 to 11, you can follow if you have a Bible, we'll have it on you as well. I want to read that, and I want to land our plane as we talk about this long passage. I'm going to read it for us. So Paul is speaking here, and he's now taking a moment to just describe his own life and his own dynamic as he's contemplating, looking back to the city and how his life and journey has gone. For we are the circumcision who worship God by the Spirit of God, I uh, worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. So that, that you can see, that is on a horizontal level, we put no confidence in that. Confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So Paul is trying to say that he was a Jew of Jews. He was one of the greatest Pharisees that ever lived. He was persecuting the church. He was legitimately doing this law thing. He was keeping it on the finest levels. But then he says, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Alright, so here now is a little bit more light on this treasure that we want to buy. So Paul is saying that if you compare these things back in the city to knowing God, they actually don't, don't even measure closely together. It's so much more valuable for Paul to know Christ than anything else on his massively impressive CV. He was a Jew that did persecute the church. He was from this very well-known, important tribe. But he says that all is a loss. That all is a loss compared to knowing Christ. So just to give you some context, it was good as Paul was saying to us today, I'm a very important political figure. People respect me. People know me. I make a great deal of money. I have a hard, hard degree. I... People want me to be part of their business. And I'm spiritual. This is like the whole package. Paul had it all together. All right? And Paul is saying, I count it all as rubbish for the sake of Christ. Yeah. He says, indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And then he says these words which I find massively encouraging. He says, for his sake I suffered the loss of all things. This amazing CV of mine, these things back in the city. And I count them as rubbish in order that I might be, um, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own. I'm so thankful for that part. He says He suffered the loss of those things. So, brothers and sisters, one very important thing we need to acknowledge is that it's painful to let go of the things in the city. It is painful to let go of those things that we find precious in our lives. Do not make them ultimate things in our lives. It's painful. So I'm fully appreciative of those things that you need to suffer in order to gain Christ. I won't know nearly the complexities that you need to suffer, but Christ knows. Christ definitely knows what you had to suffer. And here's the amazing truth. You'll never be a fool for suffering the loss of those things back in the city to gain Christ. Why? Because Christ is so much more valuable. His kingdom is so much more valuable than anything else in your life. And that's why faith is so important. Because when you walk out here today, you'll need to go and make one of those 35,000 decisions. And that number one decision is always based on Peter, or insert your name there, what is the most precious thing in your life? Our culture is obsessed with balance. You know, popular psychology tells us we should just be more balanced. We should have a healthy balance. And that's important. But your gravitation would always be towards the things that are precious to you. 
Just think about that. Think about your week. The moment your week was crashing to pieces, you actually lost sight of what was actually truly precious. There's a moment that took control of your mind. There's a moment that really discouraged you or worked you up, and then everything just started crashing out of place. Isn't that how it works in our lives? So trying to figure out what's the most precious in your life is the most important thing you can be busy with. And God gives us the answer here. He says, it's my kingdom. If you come for my kingdom, you will never be disappointed because this is so much more valuable. So I'm going to try and give you a very stupid illustration. Let's say we're getting to December time and you're going on holiday with a family or you're going to visit, visit family down in Cape Town. And you said to me, yes, Peter, you won't know what I just found. I found two horses and a little thing that they can pull. Me and the kids, we can all fit on this little um, cart with the two horses. We're going to go down for holiday. We only have two weeks. But the nice thing about our cart with the two horses is that they, they only eat grass and some water. It's going to be very safe. You know, they don't go too fast. We're going to have a great time down in Cape Town. We're going to have a great holiday there. And I was like, Are you stupid. I mean, you're going to be traveling for all your vacation, then you get there, and then you still need to come back with your two horses. One of them would probably die on the way down there, or catch a cold, or something would happen. No one travels like that anymore. That is so much inferior. You can take a bus, you can take a car, you can take a plane. You'll be there within a few hours, and you can be back, well-rested, within two weeks. That is what we are like when we love the things in the city, compared to loving God and knowing Him as our ultimate treasure. Are you following with me? It's like saying, no, I love these two horses, they're amazing. It's great, they are great, but there's so much more in how you can travel these days. It's so much more affordable, it's so much more safer, it's so much more efficient. That is how we are if we don't have God as our ultimate treasure. So I hope you're getting the point here this morning. It's not so much about leaving everything in the city, but it's giving the things in the city their proper place in your affections, in your worship. All right, so there's an order towards things here. All right, so it's not to be, go, be drastic and sell everything and call me Monday morning and say, Peter, what now? So that's, that's not what we're saying. There's an order to the things we worship, and that's how we are created as human beings. John Piper made this very helpful statement. Um, I think it is on there, guys, if you can help me, please. So the Son of God's glory, this is what John Piper says, was made to shine at the center of the solar system of our soul. And when it does, all the planets of our life are held in their proper orbit. All right, so we know how the universe works. I don't really know, but what I do understand is, is if the Son is at the center... All the planets are actually keeping in the orbit. Everything revolves around the sun that's in the center. There's a gravitational pull that keeps everything in its proper place. If you take the sun out of our solar system, everything would collide. It would be not just only load shedding forever, <laughs> but there would be zero planets left, all right? There would be complete chaos. It would just be whack like that, all right? So without the sun at the center, nothing would work. And this is exactly the same with our lives. If God is not at the center, if His kingdom is not the most precious thing in the center of your life, nothing else will work. Things would go all right. Things would work somewhat. But there would be always a crash of planets. All right. And I, I want you to take some stock this morning and just ask yourself, what planets are becoming the sun in your life at the moment? Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, God says, Jesus said, we should consider the cost of following Him. He said it's impossible if we follow Him and we don't consider the cost of the suffering that we need to let go of the things of this world in order to be true followers of Him. You can't say to God, God, I love you, you're amazing, love to sing to you, but then I also want to bring this thing of the world along. That's not giving honor and worship to God. It's like saying to my wife, I really want to be faithful to you, but I have another girl here on the side. I really love you. I love you. I give you a ring. I really love you, but I do have this other lady in my life. It doesn't work like that. 
Worship doesn't work like that. God calls ultimate worship. And God is not self. He is jealous, but He's not selfish in that way. He's loving. Because your life can't be held together if you run after these things in the city. These passions and desires to have the good life on our terms is not sufficient to keep your planets aligned. They will crash. They will crash. And here's the beauty of the gospel, which I think I miss so often, and I'm saying this as someone who struggles with this as well. We forget that it is freedom that God offers us. God offers you freedom. Yes, you'll need to suffer the loss of the things in the city, but He will give you true freedom because He'll put those things in this world in their proper place. They won't become the ultimate things in your life. And I know there are many good things, like taking care of your family, providing for your kids a good education, developing in your career, developing in your social life, having friends, doing nice things because you work hard. That's all good things. But if they become ultimate things, they are threatening God's place in your life. And those things don't have the value to carry the weight of your worship. And here's the other crazy fact. Those things will destroy your life if you worship them as ultimate things. So I want to leave that for us and with us this morning that we really do a deep, deep assessment, an asset test in our lives. What are some of these things in our city, things that we really are passionate about, that is ultimate things? And usually how we know that is the things that affect our mood, the things that get us excited, the things that make us feel my life is falling apart now. Usually when that moment hits you, you must ask yourself, what has caused this? What has caused my, me to be so angry now? Why am I so frustrated right now? What is something triggered that is revealing to me the ultimate treasure that's actually in my heart, which is not God? And I don't want to discourage you this morning. That is part of Christianity. Is God, through His Spirit and His Word, convicting us of things that are not the most precious in our lives? Showing us where we are running after things that are becoming ultimate things, which should just only be good things. That is how our lives are working. That's how our spiritual makeup is. We need something heavy, something worthy to be at the center of our lives. And that's why God lovingly calls us to sell everything if we want to come and follow Him. All right, so that's kind of the dynamic in which that works. And I want us to be, be mindful of what Christ has done. And I'm landing our plane here this morning. Um, Jesus left everything in heaven. Jesus had everything. He had a perfect relationship in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He had everything. He's the creator of the universe. He decided to say, you know what? This is amazing. But God has called me. My Father has sent me on a mission to come and live the life that no one could live, to bring my fellow brothers and sisters without even just knowing us yet in the way that we still had to be born, to come and live a life that we couldn't live. He walked our dusty streets. He lived a life we couldn't live, of perfect justice. He obeyed God perfectly. We celebrated Easter. He died for our sins. God poured out all His wrath for all our sin and all our brokenness. He poured that out on His Son. And He's overcome death. He's overcome sith, uh, sin. And He provi provided for us a way to be with our Father, with our Creator. If there's someone who knows what you need to let go in your life, it is Christ. And here's the encouraging fact. You'll never sacrifice more than He had to sacrifice. He died. He shed with His blood, with His life, to make you a child of Him. It's an open invitation. He invites you, come and die like I died, but you'll never die in the same way. And here's the beauty, you'll be free. It's the most important, most precious decision you can ever make in your life. So let us pray and ask to God this morning that He helps us to go deeper. Everything else will be playing religion. Everything else will be playing religion if we don't let go of those things that hold us back. So Father, we pray. We pray for a clearer picture of seeing Christ for who He truly is. 
Um, Jesus, thank you for the, the great sacrifice that you have made that meets us exactly where we are. Lord, I struggle, we struggle with making the right decisions. Lord, we acknowledge that we have so many things in the city that is, that is enslaving us, that's gripping us, distracting us from truly following you. Lord, we want to cry like Paul and say, Lord, we're suffering to let go of these things. Lord, there's so many deep things in our heart that keeps us bound to this earth. Please, can your spirit shed light on that and give us hope and perspective to let go, Lord. Help us to see the preciousness of eternity, eternal life in knowing you. Lord, help us to press in deeper to make you the son of our soul's solar system, Lord. Um, Help us to make sense of all the planets around us, all the decisions with work life, our marriage, Lord, our, our parenting, our social lives, Lord, our socioeconomic realities of this country, Lord. We're struggling, Lord. We need your help. Help us to see through your Spirit's help what decisions we need to make that will make it easier for us to worship you with authentic worship. Help to loosen our hands on the things that we hold on in this world, Lord, so that we can cling stronger and more deeply and more intimately towards you. Because that is the good life that nothing else in this world can offer. We pray that in your name. Amen.